Hello, everyone. This is New York City Radio. I'm your host, Tom Seymour. And I'm your other host, Ken Powell. Yeah, and this is Dave Lute. How you doing? So we're trying something pretty new, something pretty weird for us anyway, is that we're, we're trying to uh, do a, the video portion of a podcast. It should be pretty interesting. Is this still a podcast or a vodcast? A vodcast because it's video? I don't or know, maybe. It, or, is this the the, cast? or is this my uh, oddcast that I like to say? Could be. The I'm trying to get, there's a big... Oh microphone across my face. I think, okay, that's better. It's his, uh, no, that's worse. It's, it's, my, is, it's running like a, a dick into your face. <laughs> my dick straight across in my face. There's no way around it. I'm just destined my to have a is. dong in my face. Uh, and we spent hours setting this thing up, and the funny thing is, like, no one noticed a huge... It's because we were too worried about the audio problems. Yeah. But anyway, we're this here. This is a podcast. Yeah, this is a podcast. Ah, lovely. So uh, with us, we have Mr. Felix Vasquez, Jr. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Hey, how you doing? Uh, and he's uh, joining us via Skype. And Felix, we've been trying to get you on for, uh, how long has it been? Probably two months straight, maybe. Yeah. I was uh, I was uh, promoting the newest Bastard Boys concert, and you know, I was I was very busy. Oh yeah, hey, can we get a little <laughs> more volume on Felix? No. <laughs> We're having Dave run around. Uh, yeah, this is our maiden voyage of our video podcast. So, F- Felix, um, uh, so you've been, I-, I know you from when we put out the Bikini Bloodbath films. Uh, yep. Your yours were like my favorite reviews because you're always very you got them you, you, you know you thought they were funny and that it always meant a lot to me um, but f- for those of you do, for, for those who don't know uh, so Felix you're you're a pretty prominent online reviewer you've uh, you're you're on Rotten Tomatoes you write for Film Threat Cinema Crazed what are, what other stuff are you doing? Uh, uh, in the past I've written for uh, Crave Online Shock to Drop Joe Blow um, I reviewed Porno for X Critic, <laughs> and <laughs> for for a few years, it gets very monotonous very quickly. <laughs> yeah, only <I, I, laughs> so many words you can uh, write for the word penis. You know, it's just you start getting uh, creative after a while. So these are actually reviews you're writing for adult films. Yeah, that's incredible. But, what uh, what are some of the funniest uh, titles that you can remember? It was uh, I think uh, Kung Fu Nurses was one of my favorites. So it was like. <laughs> Grindhouse House and, and of course a porno. <laughs> and That's there was a uh, Sportzilla, um, Cindy Jennings. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. It's basically you know the the, the, the title says all. <laughs> that's oh, that's hilarious. That's wow. So how did how did that? <laughs> these are all porn movies. <laughs> yeah. yeah, these are all Martin Scorsese films. Well, you haven't seen see, yet. These are movies I could check out. Yeah, <laughs> for you guys. Yeah. Number, yeah. yeah. So what was that? What was that was for uh, a website or? Yeah, it's for uh, xcritic.com. Xcritic. I've never heard of that. Yeah, yeah they were part of uh, DV Talk for a while, and then they, 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 you know, went their own way. Wow. So, so, okay, how many years into your uh, career did it take you to get on Rotten Tomatoes? Like, how long had you been reviewing for sites to get to be part of one of those listed critics? <laughs> I was, um, right around the time I started um, with, with Film Thread, that's when... Um, um, the Online Film Critics Society finally uh, accepted my application. It took years and years and constant rejection, and and finally I was accepted around 2006. So. Wow! And you had been doing how long? You had been had had you been reviewing before 2006? Oh man, for since around the first time I got the internet, basically I was I was on GeoCities for a while. Wow. <laughs> they were awful capsule reviews, and I got better and better over time. You know. Wow, that's great. So, wow, that's really cool. So, um, in that, just growing up, you, you just uh, had an aptitude for it, or what got you into it? Yeah, because um, I was always been uh, very critical about pretty much everything. So I kind of um, once I once I got the internet, I kind of honed into reviews, and then I met Phil Hall, and he kind of helped me um, get my reviews out there to more and more um, readers and indie filmmakers. You know. Well, yeah, Phil Hall is that Phil Hall's gotten so many uh, people's careers started. I mean, I, I credit him with uh, he got us that first New York theatrical run of um, that movie I did. Everything moves alone, and he, 
help us get in the New York Times and New York Post and all this other stuff. So like he's like one of my heroes, you know. Yeah, he is it's incredible. He's such a he has so many years in, in um experience with any filmmaking and he is he has no ego. He is hilarious, incredible writing and once I joined Film Thread, uh, he was dropping so many opportunities on my lap. It was it was overwhelming. So like he's a great publicist. He's a great he's a great indie filmmaker. This would be great for your website, and it was unbelievable. Yeah, and if, for those for those of the people listening who don't know, um, most people who follow independent film know what Film Thread is. Originally, that was started by Chris Gore, and it was a physical magazine, right, for a number of years. Yeah. And then yeah, they. Yeah. It moved. It moved online, uh, and it still became just. As, actually, it became more popular. At you know, it probably still is, but it was doing like a million hits a month for a long time. I feel and, like an idiot. Chris Gore actually started following us on Twitter um, last week, and I was like, I know this guy from somewhere, but I don't know who the fuck he is. Oh yeah, he's so, and he yeah. writes all those uh, uh, survival guide to uh, uh, the film festival survival guide. Is that what it's called, Felix? Is that the name of it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 Um, film label for film as well. But that's his baby, and Film Threat really, when uh, he they really pushed Kevin Smith back in the day. Um, I think Ed Burns too. Like they they really uh, were proponents and and helped propel a lot of uh, pretty monster uh, independent filmmakers back in the day. So it still remains like a really important uh, yeah. you know magazine for sure. So so how did that happen? Oh 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 so so you have Cinema Craze too. Now is that uh is that your baby or is it you you know write for them or Oh no yeah I started that back in um 2000 and 2005 is when it, it, you know once I started film thread and, and met Phil Hall and, and Sasha Berman that's when everything kind of just skyrocketed basically you know That's great. So and how exactly did that happen? Like, how how did you run across Phil Hall? Did he just check out one of your reviews one day and be like, "Hey, man, this is pretty good"? Or yeah, it was it was, it was funny because I was reviewing a document, this fake documentary, of this really bad movie about these four guys who want to become the next Beatles. Yeah. So I wrote uh, I wrote the review in the lyrics of "A Day in the Life" from the Beatles. Yeah. I don't know if you know that song. And uh, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, no, I read the news today. Oh boy! Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. So Phil so Hall emailed me and he was like, "Oh, your review is great. It was so funny. I'm a big Beatles fan. I would like to get to know you more." And from there, it was it was it was great. You know, unbelievable guy. Very funny too. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so let's see what else. Well, what uh, we are going to talk about some of the the best films of uh, last year. Uh. So uh, you had recently published a list of them, right? For was that yeah. C- Cinema Craze or Film Thread or? Yeah, Cinema Craze, and I contributed a little bit to uh, Sound on Sight. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Um, so what did you think? Uh, you had a top ten best and a top ten worst. Is that what you had? Yeah, top ten best, uh, top ten worst, and uh, my five favorite indies of uh, 2013. Oh, nice. Actually, wait, can we hear those? Oh uh, yeah, it was um. It was uh, the WNUF Halloween special from Alternative Cinema. It's like it's like a found footage film that takes place during the Halloween of 1987. Okay, that sounds it's awesome. Really good. It, it's uh, it's like a fake news broadcast. Mm-hmm. And um, let me check. Well, yeah, um, I forgot the top five really, but uh, <laughs> that was one of my favorites. And that was also um, Proximity, a short film about uh, uh, two guys being hunted. By this big hunting party, they have to stay close together. They have hmm. these ankle oh. bracelets. Well, that's Film Riot, right? The uh, Film Riot they produce that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that was really good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a great movie, and I think Cargo was also one of my favorites. That was like a short zombie film. Okay. Oh, I don't think I, I don't think I saw that one. When did that? What was that uh, Spanish Jesus one, where he kills all the? Uh, Wait, does he kill? Who does he kill? Well, he's, zombies. He's fighting everything. Like, yeah, zombies. oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I forget the name of that one. Oh, I forgot to check on that. That's so good. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, what about uh, be- best? Uh, like, you know, you had a general best films of the year, right? Yeah. You got a couple for those, or? Yeah. Um. Well, my favorite of the year um, was uh, Your Next from uh, Adam Wingard. Oh, okay. So good. Yeah, I heard a lot about that one. 
cool. Yeah, I was, I was surprised. I was surprised. I didn't expect that to be my favorite, but uh, and some of my favorites were um, Inside Lewin Davis from uh, the the Coin Brothers. Yeah. Ah, man, I didn't catch that one either. That yeah. one looked fantastic. Yeah, very much. It was very much a Coin Brothers movie. Yeah, like John Goodman appears for a great uh, walk on row and a lot of great music. That's great. And uh, Rewind This was also a great documentary. Yeah. The whole chess age. Yep. From yeah. Josh Johnson. Yeah, great movie. Yeah, we had heard about that. Uh, yeah, because we're working on a documentary. It's not all about VHS, but for a little while we were shitting bricks because we thought that uh, our movie was the same movie, but ours is pretty different. So. But yeah, we there's like, like uh, Rewind This and Adjust Retracting is also coming out soon. Yeah, there's a slew of them, man. So many, but ours is more about uh, the decline of physical format. So we're, you know, we felt we feel fairly safe, you know. Um, okay, so worst films, worst films of last year. Oh man, um, Gangster Squad was possibly the worst with. Uh... Oh, that looked like shit. Oh, that was terrible. Was it's it? probably Ugh. Gosling and Sean Penn. Yeah, Sean, yeah, Sean Penn and Josh Brolin. Brolin, yeah. yeah. It's not awful. And uh, Battle of the Year, that, that dance movie with uh, Chris Brown. <laughs> oh, yeah, that looked terrible. <laughs> awful uh. movie. Oh, and Dario Argento's Dracula 3D. Oh, that was oh, terrible? Man. Oh, man. I, I, I love Dario Argento, but the last couple of movies he did, like, oh, my God. Was that when we watched Giallo? Oh, Giallo was pretty That good. was not so hot. <laughs> and then... Uh, Dracula 3, that's got Rudger Hauer in it, though, right? Yeah, Rudger Hauer, but he only has, like, a small role. He looks very confused Boy. as Van Helsing. He oh, comes on, yeah. and he fights Dracula for, like, a few minutes, and he disappears, and... Oh, man, like, I couldn't understand why why he's doing this. <laughs> Anybody uh, in this movie. <laughs> and yeah. I hate the best Dara Gento, because he's, he's an excellent director, but... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just lately, it's been, you know, not so not so hot, but whatever. <laughs> um, Let's see, what else? So, hmm. Oh, did you ever see? Did you see this movie called Computer Chess? Computer Chess. Yeah, I've heard great things about that. It's a uh, yeah, the documentary. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a. It, it's like a. What? Well, it's. It's trying to. It's. I guess it's a mockumentary of sorts. You know. Oh, it uh, is. Uh, yeah, it's a narrative. You know. Uh, but they present it like a document. They present it like a documentary shot in black and white from the eighties. It's. It's pretty fucking cool, actually. But anyway. Yeah, um, that out. <laughs> yes, that was pretty good. Um, let's see, what else do you want to talk about? Well, I mean, I just know that, like, I look at Rotten Tomatoes, and aren't they, they stopped accepting new critics for a little while, didn't they? Yeah, the, the um, certain, certain um, society, certain film critic uh, associations have, like, uh, their periods where they accept critics. Sometimes, they, sometimes uh, they'll accept them for, like, a few months, and sometimes they don't, you know, so... Well, when you got into it, I mean, I mean, there was still a, a shitload of online critics, but do you feel like in the last maybe five years it's it's exploded? You know, people have gotten sort of blog fever, and everyone's a critic now, or yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much how it's been. Pretty much, everyone can sign up for WordPress or Blogspot or Tumblr and make make their own review website. You know, so it's kind of hard to create a, your own distinct voice out of everybody else. You know. But do you feel like you've gotten? I feel like you got in under the wire, where like you had really good writing. You got into the Film Critics Society. You're writing for you know major online uh, press. Um, do you want? Do you often wonder if you started today? Do you think you'd have a harder time? Oh, definitely. I'd have a very hard time because everybody everybody has a, a gimmick now, and I really just uh, go on and write my review and and move on and look for something else to write about, but everybody has like their own specific gimmicks that they do now, you know, and it's very hard to find, it's very hard to stand out among everybody else, you know. Yeah. yeah like, Freddy in Space and VHS Shit Fest, you know, two great websites, but, you know, they have their own voice, it's very hard to, to find your own frequency in everybody else's blogs, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, also, I imagine, like, when you got to be part of, uh, when your reviews started getting listing on Rotten Tomatoes, when, I mean, that that's the, I actually think that's probably a huger deal now than maybe it even was when you got on there. Do you feel that way? Or 
Yeah, yeah, it really is because uh, I know a lot of uh, um, online bloggers that are constantly emailing me asking me how to get on tomatoes and how do I get on, can, you know, can you put me on there and it's, it's, it's actually pretty cool to be listed alongside like Scott Weinberg and you know at one time Roger Ebert, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty phenomenal. It, it's yeah. I feel like in, in cinema has gone a little bit that way too, like back in the day like the big push was to try to get into Blockbuster and then with some of my movie titles we get on Netflix and at the time we were like ah okay Netflix that's pretty awesome we're still happy about it you know but yeah. not all the titles went to Blockbuster and now fast forward that's all people want you know yeah. they're like you had movies on Netflix it's like yeah we we did it and what's really important but it was a to it was a bit different back then you know yeah so, definitely so, but I th I still think that's that's you know pretty amazing. Um, any have you ever gotten any nasty feedback from a review? Is like a filmmaker ever like dropped you an email and been like, dude, you <laughs> this is bullshit or anything like that? Oh, definitely. Oh, a bunch of times. Um, somebody um asked me for my review of Tokyo Drift on Film Thread. They're telling me I don't know anything about cars and to set the f up. <laughs> And uh, another guy was telling me I should I should stop writing reviews and go pay my rent because I need to feed my children or something like that. Something I don't, I don't ridiculous. Know. That's supposed to be an insult or anything like that. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. And another, another guy quizzed me on his movie, you know, trying to lay out where I got his movie wrong. And it's like I tell everybody, you know, it's just one opinion. You know, I could be the minority opinion tomorrow morning. You never know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, it's I Phil Hall says that way too. He's like, look, at the end of the day. This is my opinion. It's how I feel about the film, you know. I mean, certainly, yeah. you and Phil Hall are. Well, your your writing is way better, and it's a lot more informed than ninety nine percent of the any of that the bloggers out there, you know. So, thank you very much. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, Ken. Did you have any uh, any questions to ask uh, Felix? Uh, actually, yeah. Uh, did you have you heard about the Armand White uh, thing that happened? I guess over the week. Oh yeah, with uh, Steve McQueen. <laughs> yeah, the Steve McQueen. I mean, what's your feelings on Armin White? I mean, oh, I don't want you to like you know, go after another critic if you don't have anything like if you don't want to talk about him. But I mean, what's your feelings about him? And like, I I think this is like the second or third year in a row he's actually gone after somebody at this um, um, ceremony. So yeah. like, uh, do you have any feelings about him or, or any any take on him? I mean, it's, I think he's he's you know there's this uh, there's this idea that everybody has that. Film critics are just basically failed filmmakers, and I begin to think Armand White is that um, film critic who just couldn't hack it as a filmmaker. So now, whenever some someone gets higher accolades than he does, he just spits ball on them, and I really, I, I really don't get it. <laughs> Steve McQueen is an is an excellent director, you know. If you're not a fan, you're not a fan. But I really don't understand acting so unprofessionally with uh, screaming and calling him a garbage man, you know. Yes, it it's pathetic. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. Pretty uh, like uh, it's not very professional. Like I, I think critics they they have a hard enough time. Like I mean, they're giving opinions, and uh, filmmakers can, it can uh, maybe sometimes uh, affect them. So when you have a guy like Armand White actually like personally attacking people, it really hurts. I think the critics as a whole because he, I mean, for the average person. They just see him as just a critic. They probably a lot of people don't know his history of like you know being this contrarian and and they just see him as like another you know that's how critics are. They're boorish and they're 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 pig headed yeah. and I think he's like, he's really bad for the, the 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 film critic community. Yeah, exactly. I'm pretty sure a lot of people that read the article said that's why I hate movie critics. You know, they never. I'm pretty sure no one really knows who he is as as. As an individual, like uh, you know, the, the filmmakers and other film critics do, so yeah. he's kind of perpetuating that image that film critics are all like failed filmmakers and uh, and you know, obnoxious and loudmouths, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm obnoxious and loudmouth, but only in my own time, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Felix, any uh, any uh, any plans on the horizon? Like, do you uh, or do you have aspirations for uh, you know? Uh, uh, writing a book, or uh, you know, where do you are you looking to expand it all? Like, if you had a dream review job, you know, where, what would it be? 
Oh, I would I would love to write uh for the A V club of the Onion. Oh yeah, okay. Awesome. That would be that would be it for me. But uh right now I'm 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 sapping um a science fiction book now. I'm getting help from my friend uh, Neil Bailey, he's also an excellent writer who's helping me out. And um I'm basically just uh trying to get more attention to my website than ever, you know. That's Cinema Crazed, right? Yeah, Cinema Crazed. Yeah, so yeah, everyone out there, cinemacraze.com. Uh, I've been going on that site for for years. It's it, again, it's one of these independent film website staples, you know. So it's like sites like Film Thread or uh, Ain't It Cool or uh, Cinema Craze. These are really important, you know, especially for independent film, you know. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, let's see what else. Uh, dream jobs. Hmm. Uh, have you ever uh, shot any movies or anything like that, or? Um, no, not that particularly. No, uh, I tried screenwriting once, but uh, the, the the format was too uh, technical for me, so I started doing this regular fiction writing, you know, the, the narratives. But I've never actually made a film before, not really. Yeah, that's yeah. cool though. Yeah, I mean, um, that would be really cool. So the uh, sci-fi book. What do you think? How long is it going to take you? Uh, I was just finished. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm oh. trying to get uh, a pitch uh, um, sent out to book agents soon. That's great. Oh, did you check out uh, Phil Hall's uh, uh, greatest bad movies of all time? Oh yeah, yeah great book. Re- really great book. As usual, he's such a great writer. You know. <laughs> yeah, he makes every. It's like any any. You can open up to any page in that book, and kind of basically read the story he writes about. Each film, and it's uh, it's hilarious, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, when I when I got the digital copy, I was, I only told myself I, I'd read like a chapter, and I ended up reading the entire book in one sitting. You know, it's just, it's, it, he, he's so funny, but but he, he writes so eloquently. It's, it's amazing. In there, is there any uh, uh, last question? Is there any uh, any uh, favorite review that you wrote? You know, like when you think of reviews, is there one that you wrote that you actually really like? Um, I really like the, the the essay I wrote recently about uh, the Iron Giant, my oh, favorite yeah. of Iron all time. Giant. That's a yeah, that's a phenomenal animated movie. Yeah, I think I love we that did movie. a list of top top animated films once. I think that came up. Yeah, that was in there. Uh, I think when we did the Facebook question, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did the Facebook yeah, was, question. Iron Giant was brought up a lot. Yeah, well, hey Felix, uh, appreciate you so much coming on. I know it's yeah. been chaos. Yeah. Uh, well, I understand. Yeah, but uh, come back on again now that we we have this uh, troubleshooted. Uh, yeah, um, definitely join us again. Um, if you ever want to pop in and just talk about a couple movies that you saw, uh, you you know you're always welcome. Definitely, um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. So and again, check out uh, cinemacraze.com, Film Threat, and then those usually end up on Rotten Tomatoes, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Awesome, man. Okay, well, uh, Felix, thanks so much, and uh, we'll we'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, everybody. All right, bye. <laughs> All right, bro. Bye. Okay, so that was the uh, that was Felix Vasquez. Awesome dude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he works for two great websites, like you say, Film Threat, Cinema Craze. Yeah. Great websites for movie reviews, discovering independent movies. Uh, those are like the two of the first places you should go. Like if you're Looking for something. Yeah, I mean, like independently written, um, very well thought out uh, criticism from a place of knowledge. Um, you know, he's been doing this for years, um, and uh, yeah, just an all around cool guy. So, yeah. um, so let's see, what else? Uh, well, I just talk about something we've seen because we've been on like this long ass break. It's been like I think three weeks since we recorded an episode. They say we got this nice little webcam thing going on. Um, but I went and seen a few movies over the uh, break. Uh, they would catch Wolf of, Wolf of Wall Street, uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, newest film. And though it was three hours long, it didn't really feel that way. It, no. it was just a great, I think, a great, great movie. Probably the best comedy I've actually seen this year, and maybe in yeah. a long time. It's the best comedy of the fucking year. Yeah, it is hilarious. It, it's almost like you know, the the gags or it's not even gags, but the, the comedy bits are just so well spaced. It gives you time to enjoy the moment, set you up for the next one, get that next laugh, and then when it's spaced out again, 
Um, I guess this is going to be sort of like a combination of Anchorman 2, which I had <laughs> seen, where that movie was two hours long. It felt like it was actually a three or four hour movie, and the gags yeah, were just so such a mess. mess. Yeah, movie. they were on top of each other. There was no spacing of the the comedy. You, sometimes you got to let the comedy breathe a little bit, but it's just like trying to hit you over the head with so many gags. It just it didn't work. Whereas in Wolf of Wall Street was just hilarious. It was impeccable. You know, I mean, a lot of it is held together by uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's uh, uh, his narration. Yeah. His sort of, um, you know, I don't know what you call it. I'll call it sort of a Annie Hall, Woody Allen, I'm talking to the camera Hammer, sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, you know, that stuff was amazing. And the editing, Scorsese's editor is just a fucking yeah. genius. Like, yeah. she's, you know, amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think Leo's performance is really good. I think Matthew McConaughey's. When I first saw the trailer and I saw his, you know, the, 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 his bit in that uh, trailer, I thought it was, I don't know, cheesy, a little bit cornballish. I wasn't sure if I was going to like it, but when actually when I saw it in the movie, it was, it was hilarious. It yeah. was just great. It, 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 so he was great in it. Jonah Hill was actually really great in it. I mean, it's the first thing I can tolerate him in. Yes. Yeah. I mean, his teeth were ninety percent of his character, yeah. but he was very good. Yeah, he was very good. All of them were great. Um, I also know that any time a character in a movie gets hit with a tranquilizer or some kind of doped up thing, it usually leads to hilarity because, like, when Leo, I think that's probably the funniest scene, whenever he's on these quaaludes and he can't move. Well, th that scene, yeah, he's he's paralyzed, he's sort of wiggling around, and it somehow it works within the context of the film, I think, because it's such a crazy, boisterous, big... Yeah, uh, extravagant. It's a circus, really, is what it is. And but that scene is like within an inch of its fucking life. That scene is like, it it's perfect. It works exactly perfect for what it is. Yeah. But it's like a half a step away from a fucking Jim Carrey bit. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's so close to being. Well, I was gonna bring up um, Will Ferrell's um, this not Anchorman, but um, old school. Whenever he gets hit with a tranquilizer dart, and uh, once again, I think that I always thought that was probably one of the funnier parts of the movie. But it is like it's a borderline being almost too much. You have to have the actor to, to rein it in, or the the director and the editor to know whenever like it's just enough to not, you know, be too much. I think this movie, like you were saying, like is it done a good, a uh, great job from the beginning of letting us know sort of that we're in a a bit off world. Like I mean, these yeah. guys are. It's not. A, a normal world. Crazy things happen all the time. They're doing crazy shit. They're throwing dwarfs at at um, wall or not yeah. walls, but um, like darts, yep. a dartboard. There's just crazy shit going all the time. So when we get to Leonardo DiCaprio's Jordan Belf Belfort character, who's doped up on quaaludes and can't move, is just doing this weird crawl to his uh, Lamborghini or Ferrari. It just works. It's it's hilarious. You're laughing the whole time. In it, one of the major criticisms of this film is that it's you know it's it's misogynistic and it's horrible when it glorifies this disgusting Wall Street culture and it belittles the poor and uh, it's, it's sexist and racist and and all these things. I'm like, the, I, people have lost their fucking minds. Like this is a movie about criminals. Yeah. So in the same way. People love and respect God. I know that's not Scorsese, but I'm saying Coppola, Godfather, right? But uh, Scorsese, Goodfellas, or Scorsese, Departed. Those are all fucking movies about criminals. Yeah, it's not. Sick. That's the whole point. It's these these people are they're criminals out in in the daylight. You know what I mean? And and so that's why I never forget. It's like at the end of Casino, when De Niro doesn't get blown up by the fucking car at the end. It's the same thing with Leonardo DiCaprio when he gets away with everything. He goes to jail, but he pretty much gets does two years, gets away with it. So when people criticize him, they're like, oh, it's glorification. It's like, no, it's not. It's a movie about shitty people. It, yeah, it's definitely he, not glorification. He's been making fucking movies about gangsters for years. The I mean, fact this, that we know and we talk about, like, this movie is is, you know, uh, uh, all these problems, all these, these issues in the movie, it's because we, we know that this shit's wrong. Yeah. We know it. Yeah. And I think more or less this movie is, is making a statement actually about us. Yeah. Because, 
you, we talked about Leo's um, performance of talking to the camera. Well, guess who he's talking to? He's talking to the viewer. You yeah. were watching this the whole time. That makes you almost just as bad as everybody else, right? Because you're watching them do this crazy shit, but you're not walking away. You sit there and you watch it the whole time, and he's talking to you the whole time. He's talking to you, the viewer. Yeah. He's not talking to you know his mom. It's not a narration for his grandpa. He's talking to the viewer. So you're sitting there. You're seeing all, all this stuff. You're not walking away. Um, it, 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 to me, it almost makes like a statement, like how you walk out of that movie probably is more of a statement of how you are of a person. Like yeah, if, you, I mean, if you're a good person, you're going to be like, man, that is some fucked up shit. I never want to do shit like that. But if you have you know, some moral fiber issues, maybe I mean, maybe you might look at me like, oh, yeah, that shit was, I'm going to go snort some cocaine out of a girl's butthole. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I just, I don't understand. I think that that, that criticism is is utterly ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's not a it's a fucking R rated movie. Yeah. Um. And people are like, oh my god, it should have been NC seventeen or X. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Like, you know, watch a movie from the seventies or something, and you know, watch some horror movies and look at how much nudity or, and you know, yeah. sex is in those. And I'm like, you know, people need to, you know, it's because it's you know Leonardo DiCaprio, but. It's Scorsese. I mean, he's never censored his stuff. No. It's always been, you know, as real as he could make it, you know? Yeah. Uh, to me, I had no problem with its rating. Like, it's rated R. I would definitely say, um, you know, if you're under 13, you probably should, shouldn't be in the movie. But, uh, you know, for a rated R movie, you're supposed to be technically 18 to get in. So I think an 18-year-old can handle this movie. Uh, yeah. There wasn't, uh, I mean... I mean, if 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 the argument is a well, you know, an eighteen-year-old might not be able to process that this is a movie about disgusting people. They might just see the all, the money in the cars and go, well, maybe I'd do that. But I, I think that's also the point of the movie: it's to dangle this thing and say, well, look, this is a sexy world, and these are horrible people. But that you know that there is a sexiness to this, you know, this lifestyle or whatever. But um, but you also, I mean the. There's, he's such clearly a moral, an immoral character. He's like, ah, I'm selling garbage to garbage men. Well, I'm like, that's a, one of the, that's a fucking horrible thing to say. But I didn't go, how dare this movie? Yeah. How dare you, Scorsese? I'm like, you out of your fucking mind? Like, it's a, it's the same thing when, you know, they're whatever, and um, when put, you know, um, Pesci's beating someone to death with a baseball bat. Yeah. I mean, no. I, honestly, in that argument of like, you know, him selling garbage to garbage, man, it, it's like, you know, that's a horrible thing to do. But I've also heard arguments, and I sort of agree with this too. Like, I mean, those people were sort of stupid, anyways, to buy and shit. I mean, like, I don't know. Part of me is like, why the fuck would you buy that shit, anyways? Why wouldn't oh, like penny people, stocks or whatever? Yeah, penny stocks. Why the fuck would you spend, you know, ten grand on some shit that's being uh, built in a basement in Idaho. I mean, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to feel completely 100% bad for some of the people that got suckered into well, the money. But because uh, even, even, well, even the rich, even it's almost like, uh, uh, you know, there's like um, what McConaughey's character was basically saying, that even the, the rich, the rich were basically addicted. So they were, they were not necessarily any better. They were just yeah. buying better stock. Yeah, buying he said better basically, stuff, you know, no stockbroker really has any. Basically, said they have really have no inside track. If they did, then they they would be breaking the law. So, they're just kind of talking up bullshit anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it's just the rich people have more money to throw around on better, better quality of quality. stock. You know, so it didn't make them look any any smarter necessarily. Although you do hear Leonardo DiCaprio the whole time, like sort of, you know. Kind of try to sell selling the intelligence of the rich or something, yeah. But which didn't really, you know, didn't yeah. really ring true. But we also look at like at the end of the movie, the the Jordan Belfort character, he's giving seminars to people, and it, it's not like he's no longer living that lifestyle. That's for sure. Like so, so we do get to see like the end product of like this is this is how you get shot out on the end. You're you're giving seminars to a bunch of people in Australia. And it's not like you're raking in the dough anymore. So he sort of did get, I mean, like, granted, he only went to prison for, like, I think four years. And he's getting to make some money. He has, I guess, probably a decent wife. But it's not like he, he came out on the other side, like, you know, 
stacks of cash, and he's like, you know, has a new yacht to replace his other one that, you know, got destroyed. So he he did. I mean, he did. There was, I guess, a little bit of uh, an upcoming to him, but maybe not why some people were expecting. Like he should have been in jail for like yeah, fifty years. But it, it, but it, I don't know. For me, it basically said. He, for me, it felt like he got away with it, and that was the point. Is that I almost thought it was a a reference based upon a novel, I think, right? But I think it was a reference to. Um, you know, like what happened in the the uh, you know that when the bubble burst. Oh yeah, the economy. And it was kind of like no one really, no one, you know, no one maybe one crimes, person went so. to jail. I mean, they basically, you know, fucked everyone over. You know, had all these whatever derivatives, and you know, and and so basically, you end up where no one really got punished. Some of the major corporations paid some dough out. But didn't even have to admit guilt, and and then they kept going, and everything was kind of okay, and that's kind of you know, yeah. I mean even you know so, but I thought it was, I thought it was an amazing film. I think it's one of the best films of the year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had fun in the in the movie watching it. It's one of those few rare occasions where like you're you're having fun as everything's unfolding. Um, yeah, so I would give it like a four and a half sandwiches. Like I you know really enjoyed it. And you know, I don't know. I might put a best of list together for the next episode, but right now that would be like that had to be my top five, I think. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was great too. Um, let's see. So what else? Can Check I, anything else out? Um, yeah, yeah. Can I talk about Dave? I can maybe get Dave in the conversation. Nice. Dave is busy on his phone. I was trying to fucking get the, the live stream. stream, but I can't find it. You're right here. <laughs> You're right here, Dave. Why, yeah, why do you need to see it live? Because I'd rather see the world through my phone. Uh, interesting. Nice, one of those. Um, so, Dave, I watched this documentary called Glow, the gorgeous, oh, the gorgeous ladies, ladies wrestling. of wrestling. I used to watch that when I was a kid. And I never heard of it until Tom told me some hot ones. Yeah, it, well, it was, I think it was the first uh, you know, professional uh, wrestling, female wrestling, female wrestling association. Documentary's fascinating. I remember some of the characters. Do you remember Farmer's Daughter? Yeah, and then there's uh, Hollywood and Vine. Yeah, Mount Fiji. Yeah, Mount Mount Fiji <laughs> and Big Bad Mama. Yeah, that's funny. I used to watch that um, on this couch right here. You're sitting <laughs> really? as a kid. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, because this is from your old house. So wow, oh, really? It's old piece of shit. That's why it smells. Yeah, I mean the not that the fact that Mama lays on when uh, you know W well it used to be WWF when we were growing up when yeah. that was that was huge. We saw you know this thing called Glow. Came out gorgeous ladies wrestling and and it was fucking huge too. Wrestling was so big. It was so big, yeah. And when female wrestling came out, and you had a lot of like heavy set wrestlers, but you also had very attractive. It, it's kind. It was kind of like the the yin to the yang. I mean, it's yeah, the same thing with definitely. yeah. And then and people at the time, some people were like, oh, this is bullshit. This is objectifying women. But all of the women who were in this documentary were like. I loved it. It was empowering. It was great. And really, if you look at the flip side, they were good. The, the, ma yeah. the male wrestling is there's zero difference because it's all aesthetically perfect men. Yeah, exactly. And there's a there's a lot of a lot know. and then some like freak freakish. Yeah, yeah. Kind of size. Yeah. And stuff. Okozuno. Yeah. And yeah. And, yeah. and it, the you giant. know, it's the same. It's a parallel, but they were they were doing really innovative stuff, and it was kind of like theater, but, you know, so is, the, you know, the, the male wrestling, too, but it was fucking awesome. I saw this on Netflix, and uh, it's still there now, and I was like, I gotta fucking watch this. Glow Girls, holy shit. That's awesome. And I think they only went for four years, and some sure. of the women went on to wrestle for WWE, which, you know, which is what it is now, ended up doing some female wrestling at some point. So I think some of those women got absorbed into that eventually. Yeah. But, um, but the the weird thing is, is they cast, they had a, a casting, and they didn't tell anyone it was for wrestling. So they had all these people show up, and they're like, "Oh, it's for women's professional wrestling." Like half of them left, <laughs> and then they sent this very serious wrestling trainer, uh, this this guy to to train all the women, and do this really great job. So they started wrestling. But what he, you know, what he was claiming is that you know how like you know. Wrestling just totally damages your body and 
Um, but he, he was saying, you know, it's not, he said for women in particular, it's even harder on their their bodies, you know what I mean? But they showed it was like all of the the kind of bigger women who were on GLOW, uh, it was like three or four of them were in wheelchairs. Like the, everyone who was, you know, over 200 pounds, they were all, they all had problems. They all had back problems. Their backs were destroyed and, you know. So it was kind of, it was kind of, you know, a little sad a little bit. But I can imagine because a lot of the like the professional wrestlers, most of those guys were athletes since they were like seven, you know, five, seven years old. They played football, like a majority of them played football at one point. So their bodies are, are built strong. They they they're used. I mean, they can take I think a lot of punishment. Yeah. With, with like a lot of the female wrestlers, so you hear about them like they'll like you know they didn't start training until later on. Well, they were at, they were actors. Is yeah. what a lot of. I mean, and that's probably different in the WWE. Like they're probably dealing pe- with people who are more ath- athletes. Athlete, yeah, yeah. But in Glow, they hired performers. I mean, some were dancers and stuff like that. But and I just think, I mean, it wears on anyone. There's plenty of guys who have. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, well, men's wrestling people die. You know. Yeah, they've but, had a serious problem with that. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, this was. Uh, and, and it's definitely up for debate, but the, the trainer was like, "Well, I've been training guys and you know guys and gals for a long time." And he's like, "They're I guess their bodies wear out differently, you know." But and I guess anyone who's heavy, they are kind of have back problems. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah, sure I'm Andre sure. the Giant was back was kill and well, all messed yeah, up. All know? those guys, definitely. I'm sure they have like, back problems, knee problems. Yeah, they're dying from his condition, or every he had. In a large heart or something. Large Gigantism. Heart, yeah, something to do with his heart. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but it was a really great documentary. I think it was actually empowering. It's about, you know, strong women. I think I made the breast sign. I didn't mean to. I meant strong women. I didn't mean to do the... Sorry. The breast? I like... Yeah, now you got to watch yourself, like what you're doing here. What do you mean? You know, vis- Visually, I was like strong. I meant like strong, strong like bull. And I think I did the, the boob thing. Sorry, I didn't. But you mean guys it. don't. It was usually like during the podcast to take my pants off and I play with myself. Um, I can't do that anymore though because we're we were. On, I, oh, I had the soda. I had my because yes, we would let that happen. I had my drink down near my balls, and then I for like twenty minutes. Okay. I was like, it probably looks like a wiener. <laughs> you wish. And, yeah, that's true. Anyway. So uh, that documentary is uh, it's it's pretty awesome. It's definitely worth checking out. Um, nice. They have this big sort of reunion at the end, and everyone's like really glad to see each other. Anyway, it, it brought me way back because I used to watch that stuff, you know. Nice. Um, let's see. Did you watch any other uh, flicks? Yeah, I watched. Um, I'll do a quick review for I guess Forty Seven Ronin, the Keanu Reeves. Ah. Um, one of the biggest bombs of the year, apparently. One of the biggest bombs of all time. It's, it's, I mean, like, I'll, I'll just go ahead and say, like, I don't think it's a bad movie. I don't think it's a good movie either. I think, like, if, if it was on on a you know, Saturday morning or, you know, midday Saturday, click on, watch it, and you'd be fine wasting a couple of hours, and you wouldn't feel like you, like, were robbed of your time or whatever. Um, but... It has its problems. The movie should not have cost. Uh, there's like the estimates are anywhere from 175 million, all the way up to 200 and I think 50 million that this movie cost to make. It should not have cost that much. It didn't feel like it was that cost that much. It, it was going to be a tough sell. For just what the subject matter of the movie is. It deals with a lot of the the um, honor in the Japanese culture and like uh, suicide and what it means to, to take your own life. Versus, like you know, uh, dishonor and you know having to to be hung or killed in another way. It dealt with that. It doesn't have a typical Hollywood happy ending for it too, as well. Uh, and it doesn't. There's not really a lot of happiness in this movie. Like it, that might be a big hurdle to a big you know thing, hard to sell. But there's one character that brings a little bit of like I guess joy to this world. I just wish that they would have maybe have spread that out more. Uh, it, it could have helped it, I think, like marketing the movie and for the overall enjoyment, I think, of, of the experience. Um, outside of that, though, the action is fun. Um, the special effects aren't too bad. I mean, I don't feel like there's like $250 million special effects, but 
what is there is it, it's nice looking. It, none of it looks like you know. I wouldn't say it looks like shit. Um, it's a, it's a good two hours. I mean, it, like I said, it's, it's just a waste some time. I think it's the perfect movie to do. It with. I th- I think you were saying. I think we had a discussion about it. If you if you you said if we were talking about it, like hey, if you had found out the budget was like forty or fifty million, yeah, I'd be like, yeah, that's probably about right. Yeah. I mean, uh, Keanu Reeves probably like you know he lost a little bit of money in this. He probably put some like he probably did like a some kind of deal like I only get ten million, but I get some back. And I was like, okay, yeah, would be fine. It's probably about fifty million dollar movie, you know, uh, even a hundred million. But uh, okay, maybe it's a tad bit much, but it, that, that's Hollywood for you, you know. Yeah. Uh, and you also hear that it's the director's first time directing a movie. How does that happen? Uh, I'm just like, how does that fucking happen? Their first time out of the gate. It's like yeah, Keanu Reeves and, and uh, two hundred million two hundred million dollar budget. And you usually hear, wow, well, they they are really good at commercials, you know. It, it's hard to shit on that because some of my hair, like Ridley Scott, directed commercials. A lot of people come from commercials. Yeah, but actually, if you've ever seen Ridley Scott's fucking commercials, some of them are fucking phenomenal. Really? I think he did the one. It was like the Apple commercial about the guy throwing the hammer into the screen. Oh, the 1984. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was like his, you know, at the time. That was like, holy fuck. Yeah, you that know? was really cool. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, I was like, some of these people, you're like, what the hell? And I hear stories from friends of mine who met some of these directors. And they, they're, some of them are clueless. They have like almost no technical knowledge, and they don't even know how they like. I don't know. I got to direct this movie. I, you know. And it, it, I'm not gonna name names, but like sometimes you're like, is this is this such a fucking rotten industry where it's just purely nepotism? Like you don't, they don't even care about competency. You know, like well, it doesn't matter. DP is good. You know, we got these stars. Eh. We could put a fucking, you know, a dog up there, and they'd be able to direct. Yeah, I, I think for a first-time director, too much on his plate. Like, it was just too much to pull off. Even though, like, I, I don't think directing would probably be this movie's biggest issue. Like, it, some was of, he a special effects guy? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I that don't happens know he, sometimes. He could have been. Sometimes uh, special effects guys are like, "Yeah, go ahead, direct." You know. I think if I remember, like, I looked on his IMDb, uh, IMDb, and he'd done, I think, like a short, one short, and then he has this movie to his credit. And that was it for <laughs> for directing. So, uh, so yeah, maybe, was, I mean that's crazy. true. Some of the, remember the, what was the guy District Nine, right? District Nine, yeah. Didn't he do like that fucking amazing short? And then the amazing short, but he also wasn't given two hundred million dollars as his next. Right, right, right. I mean, District Nine didn't cost. So I forgot the budget. It was like thirty, forty million or something. Yeah, it was even whatever that. it was. It was low it for was what it was. Like, like I'm saying, for first time director, you should probably the smart money or the smart move would be to give him thirty. I mean, even that I think is ridiculous. But if you're gonna be like that, like thirty million, be like, okay, this is how we do it at my studio. We are not giving a first-time director no more than this amount, x amount of money. Any other projects gotta go to well, somebody who's tested. With that budget, though, I mean, the, that thirty million dollar mark—that's pretty unusual for Hollywood. Unless comedies do that, sometimes we're very small. We were talking about Dread. Dread was only like forty million or something. Yeah, it was like forty million. But it, that was really unusual. Yeah, uh, I think. Yeah, it was yeah. It's weird. dread. It's it's unusual, but the like dread and District Nine though. You're like those are two movies that didn't cost no, no more than fifty million dollars. That would probably fit into like why I'd give a first time director, which you know District Nine Neil uh, Blomkamp that was his first uh, feature. So that right, 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 and, right. And, yeah. and he had done some work that sort of you know they they could yeah. see like okay, he's got the, the the talent, he can do it. So this guy, I would have been the same thing. Like if I wouldn't have picked him for my forty seven Ronin. Movie, I would have gotten somebody else. I would, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't know who I would have brought in per se. But What's John McTiernan doing? He got out of jail. I think he's hired that. Guy. Oh, he's out now. Uh, I think so. Nice. He was yeah. in there for a few years. Right? Yeah, yeah, I don't. He hasn't directed shit in a long time, right? Like, nah, I don't think so. Um, oh, can I talk about computer chess? Oh yeah, yeah. What's I that? only I only touched upon it, but it's a movie on Netflix called Computer Chess. And it's basically, it, it's a narrative. Uh, I don't know, I mean, I guess some people call it a mockumentary, but it's not even, the camera sets are like stagnant tripod shots. So it, it doesn't even, it's, what it is, it's an extremely natural feeling narrative. And it's black and white. Looks like it might even be like standard, you know, video. Mm-hmm. Like maybe even like, 
they shot it on like an old VHS <laughs> shoulder cam or something. <laughs> nice. Um, and it's about, uh, you know, I think it's the early 80s where there is a competition at like, you know, like a dirty hotel, sort of like a crappy Howard Johnson's or something. And uh, there's like a conference and they're all trying to program a computer that can beat other computers at chess or even beat a person at chess one day. And so it all surrounds that, and it's, like, really funny. You have these really amazing, very natural actors acting very, very nerdy, and the, the time frame's beautiful. Everything's done, like, perfect, you know. Um, and it's just a, it's a really funny comedy. It's, a, it's def you definitely have to be up for it because it is a four-by-three black-and-white kind of slow-paced comedy, you know. Uh, and it's a bit, you know, strange, too. But uh, I would definitely recommend it. I don't know who it's for. Like, I don't, you know, but I think it's so cool that this guy made it. Um, uh, I figured, forget the director. Right? He directed a, a couple other very, pretty important flicks. and I, Some of his flicks have gone to Sundance, but um, this one, anyway, this one's on Netflix, but... Uh, Computer chess. Yeah, they recently added it. Well, I know they took a bunch of stuff off Netflix, but they've added a bunch of stuff. Watch Jack Reacher. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's worth really talking about. I mean, it's just a, it's average. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's average. Yeah, I mean, it's you not... get what you pay for, I guess. Yeah, I mean, well, I get it on Netflix, so I guess technically it'd be sort of free. I don't, like I, don't I mean. said, you get what you pay for. So, I mean, it, it's fine. They, has, they added also um, Arnold's The Last Stand, which I'd already seen before already. I mean, it, it, once again, average... I mean, it's not anything I would tell people to go out of the way to see. Um, but yeah, I saw both of those, and they're on Netflix now, too. So you can check those out uh, if you want to. That's cool. Nice. Um, I saw... Uh, why well, I started watching that Sherlock Holmes, the BBC series from... I think it started in 2010. Um, really great. That's... Uh, what's that guy? Cumberbatch? Yeah, Benedict uh, Cumberbatch. Benedict Cumberbatch. He's in there. Watch your mouth. Um, sorry, sorry, but uh, no, it's 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 a really uh, I thought it was a really interesting series. You had seen? So have you watched all those? I or? watched uh, the all of the first season. I think the first two episodes of the second season because they do the weird thing where they they're out an hour and a half each episode, but they're only like three episodes per season. But they're all, all well, really well done. Um, they're really interesting. Interesting take on um, Sherlock Holmes, I think. Yeah, and they're uh, yeah, it's hour and a half. Yeah, I I really like that. The, it's like well, getting to watch kind of a, a movie yeah, every yeah. time. So I thought it. Yeah, and the, yeah, my only complaint was that yeah, it just wasn't that long. Yeah, um, Le leaves you wanting for more episodes. I know that, and that's a that's a good thing whenever a series does that. Oh, so they just started. I wanted to look this up. That's why I'm fucking on my phone. Uh, Andrew Bajalski, and who who directed uh, Computer Chess. He also directed Funny Ha Ha, which I think that was one of his bigger films, which which I haven't seen. But anyway, Computer Chess, really, really interesting. Really, I like it because, you know, it's just, it's totally not commercial. It's clearly done because this person was fascinated with that time period and what that was. And it even delves into this cool, like, little, there's a bit of AI and all this kind of really, I don't know, I just thought it was really cool. But uh, anyway, not to go back to that, but uh, I just want to bring up the director. Um, so anyway, yeah, Sherlock Holmes. And then it's got uh, also um, lead actor from The Hobbit in it. Uh, uh, I totally blanked on his name. Uh, let me look I keep up. saying, like, Marvin, but I know it's not Marvin. Martin. Bilbo. Bilbo. <laughs> he's, he's Bilbo Bag. <laughs> yeah, Bilbo Bag. Uh, he's also in uh, um, World's End, uh, the um, Simon Pegg. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's uh, in that. Great he, flick, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's a great actor. Is it Martin? Martin? I think it's Martin something. Martin Freeman. Martin Freeman. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. He's really good. Yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide, I think, is one of the first times I saw him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in that. Guy's like, oh, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he plays a great uh, Doctor Watson. You know, yeah. um, it's a really interesting take on Watson because he's a, uh, you know, a veteran, and you know, it's, it's he's a much sort of more a top for Watson, you know. Oh yeah, definitely a more competent, and it feels less. Less. He's more of, uh, I think, a Sherlock's equal at 
in, in yeah. a different way. I think in the Sherlock, uh, the, the books, Sherlock is clearly the superior, and even in the series, though, I mean, Sherlock yeah. is intelligently, I guess, superior, but in other ways, Watson is also, like, you know... He, Watson he is clearly... He, he, Watson's a bit more... has more uh, street knowledge, and he's surlier, and willing... He, he'll bust Sherlock Holmes' balls, and yeah, he, yeah. he's not... Yeah, he's a much stronger character. He's less yeah. of a peon, yeah. you know, which is really, you know, interesting, I think. Um, yeah, but let's see. Anything else you saw? Well, I went and revisited the Matrix uh, trilogy, which, um, you know, I hadn't done in a long time. I hadn't watched all three movies, and I watched all three movies over the course of three nights. Um, so I got to sit down and enjoy, watch it from beginning to end, and let it sort of soak in before I went into the next one. And honestly, like, I was always sort of in the camp of the, the two sequels were just not that good. Like, I never really liked them. There were moments where each one I liked different little a little bit here, a little bit there, but overall I thought the movies were basically crap. But now, like, basically ten years later, going back and watching them in, in this way, I actually sort of enjoyed the other two. Like, it, it, I think it's because, like, I've, I've had so much net time now to, to know what the other two are about and what right. they were trying to do. Zero expectations. Yeah, zero expectations, and sit back, watch them, you know, beginning to end, and, and enjoy the, the arc, you know, the the Neo, and understand, actually, it made a little bit more sense to me, like, what exactly was going on in these movies. What was the deal between the architect and the um, Oracle and Agent Smith? What was all going on? Like, it made more sense to me this time, and it was just a, a better watch. Well, you know, it's always a tough battle between, like, especially with The Matrix. The first one was so awesome, and audience have a certain... A certain feeling, a certain way they want to go, yeah. and so the sequels, like that's such a big franchise. People are just unwilling, like they look at that. It, if the plot line goes where they don't want it to, they go, "That's a shitty movie." Like rather than going, "Let me watch this for what it is," because the filmmaker clearly wanted it to make. He made this movie on purpose. It's not a fuck up. Yeah, he's like, "I wanted the story to be this." So it's like if you can go in with those expectations like, well, I wanted it to be blah, blah. Who gives a fuck what you want? You didn't make the movie. You know, it's like watch it for what it is, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, I mean, criticism is great, but when you're like, well, I think it should have been a different movie, you know, because like, people do that. They're like, well, I think this should have happened and this and this and this. You start to go, well, that's not – make make your own fucking movie. If yeah. it's criticism like – and add the, this character's acting, or this, yeah. you know, I mean, this screenwriting this actor is a little weak, or whatever. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of plot holes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, plot stuff. holes, maybe, you know, but, you know, that that stuff bugs me. You yeah. Know? Yeah, I, I think, like, what I also forget is that the first time I saw The, the Matrix, I fell asleep because it was sort of underwhelming to me, but, like, I went back and watched it shortly after that time, and then I really fell in love with it again. Yeah. And with the Matrix sequels, I never really went back and gave them another fair chance. It was always like, oh, I'd go back and watch a little piece here, a little piece there, but never gave it, like, the full, like, attention that I should have probably given it. I think, like, the the thing when I first watched them is that I was sort of fell in that camp where, like, the first one was, the plot was fairly simple. Like, we we knew exactly what was going on. They sort of up the ante in the terms of like the philosophy and the like w what's happening in this world, and it made it a little bit more difficult to follow. Like it, we couldn't, you couldn't just sit there and sort of like turn off the brain a little bit and, and enjoy what was going on. Like you had to do a little bit more thinking. Like like okay, what's happening in this world? Uh, like what are the machines trying to accomplish? Right, uh, right, right, right. What the humans yeah. are trying to accomplish? And it, you're freed up to think deeper about it. It's like there's yeah. a, the initial shock of everything. Yeah, and there's, there's a lot of there's information a lot of shit in there, yeah. And it's split in two movies, and, you know, the, well, the, the two sequels, so it's, a, 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 like I said, a lot going on. Um, you know, I, like I said, I thoroughly enjoyed them, though. Like, I would go back and say, like, uh, they're definitely, I would say definitely watchable. Are they great movies? Are they, like, you know, classics? No, not like the first one. The first one, like I say, it's a very simple story. You can watch it by itself, totally enjoy it, um, have fun with it. The other two, they take a little bit more work, and you need to watch both of them to actually get the complete story. Which yeah. you know, that could be a flaw. Like most people say, like each movie should be able to stand on its own. Like you shouldn't need the one for the other. 
which I guess, you know, it should be true. I guess that should stand true because yeah. you should always be able to watch one movie and, and get the experience. But they led me to Akira. Um, I went back and watched that again, and that's by far like the best animation movie I think I've ever seen. It's just it's great. It's fantastic because the because I'd read the Wachowskis, they got a lot of their inspiration from what they've done. The in all of their movies has come from uh, Akira, and as you can see, like different bits and pieces that they basically straight up lifted from that movie and put in their own movies. Hmm. Uh, so I would, if you haven't seen Akira as well, I would definitely go uh, check that out. They just did a new release on Blu-ray that has like the um, English uh, dub, the uh, Japanese dub, and uh, I, th I think it actually has two English dubs on it. So they have the original 88 version and the 2001 version. Is that dub. like a Dragon Ball Z type thing? No, it's not Dragon Ball Z. Like, no. My wife's been making me watch Dragon Ball Z oh recently. My God. Like, I, I get annoyed at that. I've actually yeah. I have fallen no, for that. one of the characters. Like I, like I do sort of enjoy it more now yeah. like, as older because there was a stigma with it. Like the people that watched, it, it was like, oh, you guys are a bunch of dorks. <laughs> yeah. like, I can't watch this shit. But now I'm watching. Like okay, it is interesting. It, it's sort of fun. And like I, there is a character like I'm following. Like 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 oh, he's awesome. I'll watch him. Yeah. But well, you know, um, you know, what I wanted to say is actually because it's a good time for it. Um, you know, so. For the first time, we're recording the the video podcast, so we can actually premiere the New York City Drive-In. It's uh, oh, yeah. I, we briefly talked about it one episode, but we really didn't elaborate on it. Yeah. But uh, for those of you interested, go on YouTube and the New York look up New York City C I N E Drive-In, and it's our YouTube channel. There's over 50 feature-length films from uh, Night of the Living Dead to you know, Plan 9 from Outer Space, um, you know, Frank Edison's Frankenstein, um, 50 features. Um, we have some of our best uh, celebrity interviews, you know, Debbie Rashawn and uh, Lloyd Kaufman, uh, Stars from the Room and Troll 2 and uh, Samurai Cop. Um, so this podcast will actually be on the YouTube channel, so... Yeah, yeah, so you can see, like... Um what we look like, uh, or see what we do when we're here in Mama's place too, as we're doing the episode. Yep. Um, oh, I should we should have cleared these napkins off. That's yeah, we yeah. have to be. Uh, yeah. We have to worry about that. We now. have to we're be like, more sanitary with the napkins. I can't pick my nose or itch my balls that much, yeah. or maybe I can. Maybe that's okay. <laughs> um, I mean, that might be some entertainment for the. Yeah. You can you can watch me play on my phone or trying to get the stream all freaking. Yeah, you guys can see what Dave does like whenever he's not. Um, Talking to us. Yeah. Well, once he got yeah, we, we we troubleshot. We had we, man, this is we had like a two hour setup oh, just totally. because, you know, usually Dave is like, gets the mic set and we plan the show out and we're we're up and going pretty much a half twenty minutes half hour if we yeah. want to. If we want to, yeah. And uh, <laughs> well, we take our time sometimes. With we it. do. So we were try for the longest time we were trying to figure out. Cause like one we of my can't stand each other, so it's like the longer we're together, it's just like, I want to kill this guy. Get the ah. fuck away. Because even in the camera, you can see how far apart we are. So just get the <laughs> fuck <Yes>. away. <laughs> we're all divas, yeah. Yep. I'm um, not a diva. But we were trying to figure out... Ego man. Because you know, we did the podcast, and you know, and I've heard this over and over. Oh, oh, you should do a video element. You know, my, you know, one of my friends, Mike, oh, you should do a video element. And I'm always like, Jeff, any clue what that... Because I'm like, a, you know, I'm a filmmaker, you're a filmmaker, and you go, okay, well, you can't, you don't want just one stagnant angle, you want three cameras on this coverage, and, yeah. and we, we shoot it, and then digitize it, and then edit, upload, I'm like, I can't do that every week, I mean, we, you know, there were three people, and we turned this podcast every week, for 101 weeks, we've put up some kind of show, you know? Yeah, there's always been something, and so yeah, it would be, it'd be really painstaking, and it would sort of would I think take away the enjoyment, overall enjoyment that we yeah. have with doing this. And this is sort of like the the way to, to do it without like adding extra um, work on top of everything that we do. Yeah. Um, people get to, to see the see us do the show, add a YouTube element, video element. It's another little I think building block of what we're doing here at New York. Yeah, and we're we're just giving it a whirl. I th I think it's gonna work out if we can do this consistently. Ken bought a couple of these lights, we can flick on a couple of lights Set those, set that one up in five minutes. You know, we basically have a higher end webcam that, that actually like it's C920. It's got Zeiss optics. It's it's the best one I could buy. And so 
And with YouTube, the way it is now, you can do uh, Google Hangouts. So this is actually a live show now, uh, so you can find us through if Google Hangouts. If you can Hangouts. find it. If you can fucking find it. <laughs> I don't know if there's any way to search. We gotta, we'll, At least we'll I could do that. it on my phone. Though. We'll Maybe. figure that one out and simplify it so that we can just post some kind of link or something. Yeah, you're going to have to post it. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure that one out. Um, yeah. Like I said, this is sort of still developing. Um, hopefully, like in a couple of weeks of doing this, we'll have it fine tuned. And, and this, you know, this will be on uh, this will be on YouTube. And what we were is like we've been we've been doing really well with this podcast. We get uh, eleven thousand uh, hits a month, and we're but at some point we're like, well, where do we go from here? You know, I mean that could continue to go up, but we uh, I really have a feeling the YouTube element will probably end up doubling the the viewership. You know, I, I think so too. I mean, YouTube is such a huge part of, uh, I mean, social networking for sure. I mean, it's a huge part. So this will add another little element for us to be able to reach out, hopefully reach new people, and, uh, you know, grow the audience and grow the podcast. And, uh, I mean, I, like I say, I, eventually I'd like to be able to add little other things here and there to the channel as well, maybe like, you know, own little personal reviews of Blu-rays or something, some other kind of little element. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. You're, just, you're just bullshitting me, Dave. No, that was People can sincere. see that you're bullshitting me. No. See you're... If I was bullshitting, I'd be like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> no, yeah, I'd like to you know, add a, a couple little extra things here. Nothing major, like like maybe once a month. Uh, yeah, some kind short, of little, thing, short little clips. And short little like three-minute, like, hey, this is uh, the Blu-ray I picked up today. Uh, here's the features, and you guys should check it out type thing. Yeah, do reviews and stuff like that. That's how people get lots of free shit. Uh, hey, anybody want to send us free shit? Send it yeah. to us so we can review it and uh, talk about it. Mama, Mama gives me a pile of free shit every day. Nice. <laughs> you Pick it up in a bag. <laughs> Pick it up in a bag. I was yeah, say, did you put it in your DVD player? And, uh, <laughs> for those of you... Wait, can you think Mama will come? Do you think we can hey. get her up? Mama. Hey, sure. Mama. So anyway... She's a hard we, We're recording in Mama's... There's hey, Mama gosh. the Pitbull. Hey. Recording in Mama's Police Studios. For those of you who've been listening... For the past almost two years, a year and a half. We're at like two years, yeah, because we started in your place. It's about this this time, two Can years. Can it ago. really be two years? Yeah, That's it's been two years. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's hard. Yeah. So two years of doing this podcast takes us 101 episodes to go video, and probably most people have never seen Mama the Pitbull, which we talk about. You hear about her all the time. Um, usually, whenever she's farting and stinking up the place, <laughs> but. Yeah, she's a great dog. She's the the mascot. Yeah, so I think you know that's that's pretty good. I can talk about real qu real quick. I can talk about uh, Battlestar Galactica. Battlestar Galactica, huh? Yeah, I I just I don't want to talk about it too much. I finally finished the series, so uh, I watched all the series. Uh, you gotta maybe be three or four episodes in before it it hooks you in, and then it's a pretty good series. Last series gets a little weak. And it ends off really, man. That is a dark fucking series. It's just it. You're, it's like a sprint the whole way. It keeps getting darker and darker and darker, until an end, which is not even not necessarily lighter, but like holy shit, that's a dark series. Watch the Battlestar Galactica, season one and two, and it's then in space, dude. Of course, it's gonna be dark. It's dark. It's, yes. It's, unless you're near a star. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like. Like who? Um, Whitney Houston. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Well, wait. I had an Uncine, um little um, yeah. moment, I guess. I guess we call it the New York Uncine. Um So for anybody that's here in New York right now, or basically across anywhere in, in America, anywhere it's in freezing. the polar vortex. Yeah, the polar vortex. been freezing your asses off. So... As I was walking to the podcast today, um, walking to Dave's house, I'm all bundled up, uh, got everything on, got my nice little beard, like everybody can see my beard. Um, <laughs> got your beard on? Got my beard I put on. my best put beard on. my best on. beard on for the podcast. Now, um, I'm walking to Dave's, and I walk by a, she looked fairly attractive lady, who is all bundled up and stuff too, and she was giving me like the once over, up and down, like, like. <laughs> I'll get I'll get the look one you know every once in a while and I'll be okay. like Ugh. you know like Ugh, I've seen enough I'll turn away or whatever <laughs> oh, I'm used to that but then she gave me the, the like once over well actually more than the once over up and down like does she look really? at your shoes though because I think it would no she didn't even go down to my shoes yeah. she didn't even reach the shoes she just gave me the once just over just the junk you know like a nice look over and like was kept looking at me and walked by and it got me thinking like 
it's really fucking cold right now. Um, I'm all bundled up. Um, I'm a fairly big guy. I got a nice little gut going on. Um, <laughs> got my beard going on. It's like, is it this is the time of the year like when it's really fucking cold that women want to have sex with guys that are fat because they'll keep them warm? <laughs> Do, am I more attractive now at this time of year? Because if you look at guys like in Alaska, well, they, they usually look a lot like me. They're well, they fat guys. Maybe she can't see any of the details of your your body. I don't yeah, think you're I, fat. I, well, I'm I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not skinny. I mean, you can we're definitely bo- tell bo- like with my layers. I was just thinking that like because maybe she was looking to steal something from you. Uh, she didn't look like the type, though. That's the best. But she was like, oh, he's a big bear. You can keep oh, me warm at warm night. Tonight. It's fucking cold. Why don't you cut all with me? I'm warm. I'm, I'm not fat. <laughs> I could be warm, like, too. It, I, I got Please. a little bit more um, going on in this section. So she, I, that's what I was saying. Oh, that's why I was telling myself. She was going to be the once over because she wants me to keep her warm because it's fucking cold. Maybe she liked your jacket. Uh, I don't know. It's the same jacket I wear every time, though. It's like nothing. But different. you don't see her every time. So. That's true. That's true. You, you know what I want to plug? I'm not putting you down. Uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean it. Are, are, are you done with well, your no, yeah, giant bear just, story? Just, I like the story just, actually. I really, I feel bad. Let's go back to it for a second. I feel like I cut you off. Well, like I'm saying, do you guys think think that though? Because like, uh, look at a lot of people that you think of that live in like in the Northwest or the Alaska. They're not like the tip. You wouldn't picture a hipster living out there. Yeah, uh, you know, it, with his yeah, ironic jacket. beard. <laughs> yeah, his yeah. handlebar mustache. It's not, it's not a gentrified neighborhood, so they wouldn't live. There. So they, they typically they look a lot more like me. I think like a bigger husky guy. Well, I've been to Alaska before. They're bigger husky guys. The women there, obviously, uh, I mean, there might be a, a yeah. fewer pickings, but they probably think like, oh, that guy, he'll keep me warm at night because it's fucking cold. Probably, I'm probably. I mean, even even coming from Connecticut, bizarrely enough, when I moved to New York, I felt uh, there's so many skinny, wafy guys here. That I was like, what? I felt like, ah, I'm like, fucking, man, give me some ham. I'm like, what the fuck? I, <laughs> I'll eat, but, eat you. Uh, I'll eat your face, you know. Um, I, I just count, I count on my sheets to keep me warm at night. Is that wrong? <coughs> Women Your think, shits? My sheets. Women my are sheets. a different creature, Dave. I guess, though, yeah. you know. I, I think it's probably true. They're like, man, that guy, he's got a beard. He's manly. He's got a beard and he's got a belly. He could, That'll be nice laying up against me. Uh, maybe she has some, He could chop wood. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe she, had some down, she has a down tree in her backyard. And she's like, oh, maybe oh, this, this guy, guy. cut that wood. <laughs> Mm. I mean, how many, how many tree- labor? Mm. But we're in New York. How many trees are in your backyard? Like, I have one fig tree. Yeah. See, uh, what's my backyard is my fire escape yeah, that so, I can't go out on. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to discount that one too. I'm just going to go okay. with the theory that she wanted a bear man to keep her warm tonight because it's 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 fucking freezing out. There. Oh, dude. Yeah, it is awful. I I was walking down the street too, bear and man. I had the scarf, and I'm like, I don't like bear scarfs, man. and I but I'm like, I need the scarf. And uh, and I was walking across the bridge, and the wind was blowing. <clears throat> and I honestly was like, I don't think I can be out here that much longer. I was because my nose was exposed, yeah. and I had seen all this like, like all the media just peddles this horse shit at you. Like if you're out for ten minutes, your nose is gonna fall off and turn <laughs> black, and they'll amputate it. You you're know? gonna get raped by the frost giant. <laughs> and so, the giant. Anyway. I don't know what that means. I just wanted to say <laughs> it. Big vagina. Oh, that would be frosty good. vagina. That would be a good uh, really? movie for oh. Felix Vasquez to, to review for that act, the porno vagina. site. Vagiant. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Meaty women. I think that would be horrible. I don't want to see With vagina. curtains of roast beef. Uh, you know, how would the guy like go about that? Would he like throw himself at it? Like, could you get away with that title, too? Because it's not Loops a word. It's not a real word. Vagina. Could you just have a thousand foot woman and it, it's just called Vagiant? It's a horror movie. It's like Godzilla. That's, the, that's like the. I feel like that's the land they come from. <laughs> All women? Or? No, the the giant women. The the movie. We're the movie. Like the, 50 the, the movie we already yeah. already wrote in our head. Yeah. Vagiant. Oh, I was thinking yeah. about the real women that exist, but they come from Venus. Yes. Uh, yeah. Mm. It's a, a late nineties reference to a yeah. obscure book. <laughs> yeah. I read that book. Yeah, you did. Yeah. How was that? It was good. Let's get Dave's review on a, like I say, a nine. 90- I feel like an alpha male chauvinist. So, <laughs> okay, I have to plug this. Uh, I mean, I don't have to plug. That sounds terrible. I want to plug this. There's a uh, independent filmmaker. That's what he said. No, I. <laughs> <laughs> See, and that's not like an asshole. But no, um, the uh, Ryan O'Leary reached out to me. He's an independent filmmaker from New Jersey, so he's premiering his film right in New York. 
and I saw the trailer. Honestly, I was fucking. I it was a great fucking trailer, and I was like, I I I would love to promote this. Let me let me talk about it. The movie's called The Back Seat. Um, it's premiering in New York City on January 11th. Um, so you're plugging the back seat. Is that Friday? Friday's nice. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That Saturday. is. Is that Friday or Saturday? Saturday. Uh, today's the seventh. Eighth is Wednesday. Ninth, <laughs> tenth. It, it is Saturday. Oh, uh, Saturday. Um, but check out. Go to uh, RyanOlearyFilms.com. R y a n o l e a r y Films.com. We'll post the link on the Podbean site. You can get more uh, details there. But it's a film called The Back Back Seat. It's about um, high school students, but in a in a really kind of awesome, earnest way. It's like a, it's about the main character sort of somebody who doesn't really fit in, um, and he meets a girl, and it, it was really fr- it felt really fresh. It almost had like uh, like who am I thinking of? Like uh, John Cusack sort of. Um, yeah. Uh, like a not a better off dead, but like a you know say anything sort of vibe, you know. Um, but uh, but in a, in a new way. So he actually invited us to go. Uh, I think I might try to check it out Saturday. But for those who are interested, uh, check it out. Um, yeah, RyanOlearyFilms.com. Um, and there's a Facebook page. I think if you just look up the backseat uh, movie, it, it should probably come up. What days are the eleventh? Uh, the 11th Saturday. Um, um, what's the time on that? Like 7, sure. 7 p.m., 8 p.m.? That, I don't know. Let me look at the events. I should be able to pop and, and over to it. And where was, where was that at? Let's the see. Anthology Film Archives, I thought. Let's see. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, I'm, you had your yeah. Answer. The Backseat at Anthology Film Archives. Uh, let's see. January 11th, 6 p.m. So 6 p.m. Yeah. Anthology Film Archives. That's one of my favorite venues in New York. They uh, play my movies, which is important because they're, you know. Anyway, it's a great <laughs> venue. Uh, no, it really is. I. Uh, yeah, it was a cool place. Yeah. And there's reception afterwards at 8 p.m. Um, so check this out. Actually, if you're on Facebook and you look up the Backseat World Premiere or go on Anthology Film Archives website, uh, if you just Google that, it'll it'll pop up. So 6 p.m. Uh, the Doom seem, dude seem really cool. Movie's called Backseat. Trailer. We'll post the trailer. Trailer's fucking great. Once you see the trailer, you're gonna want to go Saturday. So check it out. Nice. Um, awesome. yeah. So that's that's what I got. Cool. Uh, no Facebook question, I guess this week. Oh right? yeah, we didn't do a Facebook question again. We we this was just such a, little, a yeah, chaotic such thing. chaos. And even in the beginning of the podcast, we're fucking around with a microphone. The technical term is a cluster fuck. Cluster. Yeah. Yep. The fuck of cluster. That's okay though. Next week, you know, it should hopefully uh, go smoother. And I think we're gonna have a special guest lined up for next week. Um, that I think we'll just wait till next week. We'll wait till next week because if sure it happens, it's gonna be great. Yeah, and uh, and be, if it doesn't, then that's yeah. fine too. It's, it's, not, awesome. it's not me, so don't get your hopes up, people. No. It's um. Dave Lute. Dave Lute. Um, it's Mama. Mama's gonna speak to us. Yeah. From the, from the grave. Absolutely. Why, why is she going to be from this grave? She's going to be dead, Dave? Are you, you going to do something to her, Mama? No, I mean, like her, her past life. Oh, because she was a, you know, a princess yes. in her past life. Mm-hmm. Uh, she all right. obviously can't talk now. Yeah, uh, well, you know, this is Dave Lute, and I'm, we're well, going to sign off right now. No, yes. I was going to say, like, check out our Facebook and our Twitter and all that stuff. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know? Well, this is a reverse thing, too. For some reason, you're on YouTube, and you're like, who are these fucks? And you got to the end. Uh, you can check <laughs> you out if, the end. if you like uh, if you like podcasts. Uh, you can find us. Just look up New York City Radio on uh, iTunes. We're on Stitcher Radio. Or if you just like to listen to three sexy men talk about stuff. Yep. And yeah, then, don't uh, listen to our podcast. Listen to somebody else. Listen. <laughs> some some sexy men. Yeah, uh, some we we're on the Google Play app. Uh, I don't know. We're on a bunch of horseshit. So uh, <laughs> those those companies are not horseshit. They're great <laughs> companies. They, they they actually allow us to be no. You're, yeah, you can find us basically any anybody that carries a podcast, um, podcast feed. Google you'll, it. You can find us there. Yeah, just Google hey, it. Google it. Look it up. Google it. Yeah. So yeah, right. yeah, just subscribe to us. Uh, drop us a note. Like you say, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, uh, basically any social media that's out yeah. there. You know, yeah, we're, we're on. Like there. we said, we're on YouTube now as well. So yeah, and check out some of our other interviews. We again, we got some pretty awesome interviews with uh, many many beef, B movie celebrity. Yeah. Beefy. Beefy, meaty, cheesy. Uh, I'm your host, Tom Seymour. And I'm your host, Ken Powell. Welcome to my vagina. Check you later.
enter the vagiant. <laughs> Look at what I'm going to do now. I'm going to run over and stop this. This is like extra. extra. <laughs> oh, man's radio show.